Hello, my name is James Morowitz, and I'm a master's student at the Waterloo Center for Astrophysics, working with Professor Will Percival and postdoc Enrique Payas. Today, I'm going to be giving a presentation on my most recent project, Constraining Primordial Non-Gaussianity with Density Split Clustering. Before I get into my talk, I'm just going to provide a brief uh, outline of what I'm going to be discussing today. I'm going to begin our talk with a discussion of some background review, including important concepts like cosmic inflation, primordial non-Gaussianities, etc. In the second part of the talk, I'm going to review the key methodologies used throughout our research, including the density split clustering technique, uh, Fisher information formalism. Uh, and in the third part of the talk, I'm going to present our key findings and provide a little bit of context and some discussion to explain them. And in the final part of the talk, I'm going to summarize our key findings and provide some concluding remarks. So to begin, uh, cosmic inflation was first introduced in the early 1980s, and it predicts uh, a period of accelerated expansion, or equivalently a decreasing co-moving Hubble radius with time, in the very early universe. And this idea was first introduced in order to reconcile some of the inconsistencies that one arrives at through a standard interpretation of the Big Bang model, uh, such as the flatness and horizon problem. And both of these problems require an extremely fine tuning of initial conditions in the very early universe in order to explain its present day properties. And cosmic inflation gives us a physical mechanism for generating these fine tuned initial conditions. So we do not have to rely on pure coincidence. So cosmic inflation is now widely accepted among cosmologists today, but there do remain critical questions about it, including the particular physical mechanism driving it, its particular form, et cetera. And unfortunately, there's no direct way of measuring infl inflation. So we do rely on a variety of observational signatures in order to better understand which models could be true, which models couldn't be true, et cetera. So one of the characteristics of inflation is that we know that it must end at some point. And typically, we make approximations of, for example, scale invariance in the primordial fluctuations that are generated during inflation, which should obey uh, Gaussian statistics. But because of the fact that inflation does eventually have to end, this breaks the assumption of scale invariance and can lead to small levels of deviation from Gaussian initial conditions known as primordial non-Gaussianity. And we typically quantify this with the dimensionless parameter F and L. Uh, the most simple type of PNG that we consider is local type, which has the configuration space representation shown below, where we start off with some Gaussian distributed potential, and we perturb it with quadratic terms in the potential using this dimensionless parameter. And a detection or lack of detection of PNG is a critical tool in being able to validate or rule out different inflationary models. The simplest models uh, typically predict values that are much less than one, which means we wouldn't be able to detect them in practice. But some models also predict values that are of order one, which with slightly tighter constraints than we have now would be detectable in the future. Uh, one of the key characteristics of non-Gaussian information is that it is not uh, fully described by the two-point power spectrum. In other words, we must go to higher orders if we want to capture all the available information. And the next leading order for our purposes is the three-point bispectrum. Now, local type is obviously the most simple and well-known type of non-Gaussianity, but there do exist other types of PNG, including equilateral, folded, and orthogonal PNG, all of which are characterized by the unique signature that they leave in the primordial bispectrum and their peak limits, which are shown in this table. And each of these different types of PNG are also relevant in being able to discriminate between different models of inflation. Uh, and the reference uh, listed above can be viewed uh, for a more comprehensive review of these different concepts. So currently, the Planck 2018 uh, CMB anisotropies provide the tightest constraints for the, for the various PNG types, which are listed below. But we believe that this information content is nearly saturated, meaning we don't expect to be able to achieve much tighter constraints in the future. This is partly because um, the CMB is a 2D measurement, which inherently is limited, on top of the fact that we have a finite number of modes that we can access and easily model. And as a result, we expect that large scale structure measurements will eventually overtake the CMB in constraining power uh, with next generation surveys like DESI and Euclid, which will survey much larger volumes and number densities uh, than previous surveys. Now, one of the challenges of large scale structure measurements is that unlike in the early universe, in the late time universe, there are, there's nonlinear structure growth that can lead to intrinsic non-Gaussianities separate from any non-Gaussianities that were present after inflation. And we need some way of disentangling these two effects. And local PNG in particular is unique because it induces a scale-dependent bias when you have biased tracers of the matter field. 
And because of the particular form of this scale dependent bias, if, we ob if we're observing multiple tracers that have different linear biases, or if we just have a single tracer that has zero bias, we can exploit this notion of cosmic variance cancellation to be able to achieve tighter constraints uh, than if we were limited by cosmic variance. So in other words, shot noise is the only limitation in the constraints that we can achieve. So ideally, we're seeking some an alternative clustering method that can simultaneously capture higher order information on nonlinear scales and also exploit cosmic variance cancellation on linear scales. And ideally, this would be compressed into a single summary statistic. So one of the methods that we propose to do this is density split clustering, which was introduced by my co-supervisor and collaborator, Enrique Payas. And the idea behind density split clustering is you want to measure clustering as a function of local density environment. So if we start off with some sample volume that's filled with halos and galaxies, we can then smooth that volume using some smoothing radius, typically a Gaussian filter. And then we then take a large number of query points that fill up that volume and split them into separate density bins or quantiles based on the smooth uh, over density at their locations. So just to illustrate what I mean here, I've shown a plot on the right where I have on the left panel, uh, the projected halo positions for an XY cross section of the Kyoto simulations and the background color represents the smoothed over density and the right panel denotes the quantiles. In other words, the regions associated with particular density thresholds. And once we have these quantile positions, we can measure the power spectra. So for example, the monopole and quadrupole uh, of the halo uh, sorry, of the of the quantile halo cross correlation and the quantile autocorrelation for each environment individually. And then we can combine these into a single summary statistic, which we can then use to constrain cosmology. Now, one might wonder why is this useful? So the the intuition behind density split is that in the process of smoothing the field, we're introducing local density information into our clustering measurements. And this means that we're not we're no longer just dealing with a two point measurement. We're going to higher orders, and this is particularly relevant for equilateral and orthogonal PNG, where most of the information is contained in the bi spectrum. In principle, the density split quantiles also trace out the matter field with different linear biases, and thus, in theory, we would expect to see cosmic variance cancellation uh, due to the bias sensitivity of local PNG. So to actually test, test this out, to see what kind of constraints we would get if we applied this technique to real observations, we invoke the Fisher information formalism. In other words, we forecast uh, the parameter errors if we know the observable standard noise and we know its sensitivity to underlying parameters. So given the fact that we have access to simulations with a large number of different cosmological models, we can numerically compute the covariance matrix representing the noise and the partial derivatives of the data vector with respect to changes in the parameters. And once we've assembled these ingredients, we can build the Fisher information matrix, which when inverted gives us the kramer rayo bound, which is a lower bound on the variances that we could achieve for the different parameters. And my colleague Enrique Payas used this Fisher formalism to demonstrate that density split correlation functions can provide uh, significant improvement over two point statistics when applied uh, to the lambda CDM parameters. So to actually calculate these results, we make use of the Quixote and body suite of simulations, which originally spanned uh, the four lambda CDM parameters, um, sorry, the five lambda CDM parameters, and the neutrino mass and the dark energy equation of state hyperplane. And we focus specifically on a subset of these simulations called Quixote PNG, which focuses in particular on local equilateral and orthogonal PNG shapes. Uh, for our analysis, uh, we use halos in place of galaxies for simplicity. In practice, if we wanted to get more uh, accurate constraints, we would incorporate uh, some HOD modeling. To partially make up for this, we introduce a mass cut parameter for the halos. Uh, and this sort of acts as a proxy uh, for the different bias parameters. And I should mention also all of our calculations are performed in redshift space where the halos are perturbed along the line of sight. So all existing density split analyses until this point have worked exclusively in configuration space where we use correlation functions. Uh, in our case, we introduce an analogous Fourier space um, uh, version for the first time uh, so that we can compare the two different methods. And in principle, they should contain the same information, uh, but the mesh painting and the FFT can also avoid the computationally expensive pair counting procedure that accompanies uh, a correlation function. And this is particularly relevant for upcoming surveys, which will have very high number densities and thus be very computationally expensive. 
to illustrate the different uh, density split functions that we're including here, on the right, I've shown a plot where we have the quantile auto power spectra and the quantile halo cross power spectra for the fiducial uh, Quixote cosmology. And in the next slide, I'm going to actually start showing some of the constraints that we observe. But before I do, we'll be considering three categories for constraining power. We'll be considering just the, ha the halo two-point power spectrum, the density split functions, and then a joint fit between the halo uh, two-point function and the density split functions. So now we dig into the key results. So in the leftmost plot here, I've included the marginalized constraints in solid lines and the unmarginalized constraints, which are dashed lines, as a function of the maximum fitting wave number for each of the different parameters that we're considering. And naturally, we expect uh, that when we're marginalizing over these different parameters, the constraints will weaken, which we do indeed see. And we also see that as we in, as we fit to higher and higher wave numbers, we generally observe that the uh, that that the parameters um, that the constraints get better and better, which makes sense. And in the rightmost plot, we have um, the marginalized constraints, including the degeneracies between the different parameters, when we fit up to the max wave number. And uh, to highlight, I've included in red uh, the three uh, PNG shapes. And then the other parameters include uh, the mass cut um, the uh, and the four uh, lambda CDM parameters. So before we dig into interpreting what these results mean, it's important to also study how robust they are. In other words, are these results reliable given that we're averaging over a finite number of realizations? So to test this, we compare the constraints when using a different number of realizations averaging over. In the rightmost plot here, I have a plot of uh, the normalized constraints to the maximum number of realizations averaged over for both the covariance matrix and the derivatives. For the covariance matrix, we only find percent level fluctuations. So we can deduce from that that uh, our constraints are stable in terms of the number of realizations for the covariance matrix. On the other hand, for the numerical derivatives, we find that our constraints are systematically over-optimistic when, con when compared with the maximum number of realizations. And this is particularly problematic because uh, the constraints are more systematically over-optimistic for the density split functions than for the halo two-point. And this would lead us to overestimate the relative improvement that we'd be able to achieve between these different methods. So one of the ways we can account for this is to apply a correction where we fit a model to the derivative convergence of the form shown below, and then we take the limit as the number of realizations goes to infinity, and then correct for this in our constraints. And we did this in the table shown below, where we have the raw constraints where no correction is applied, and the corrected constraints where we apply this correction factor. And what we're considering is the ratio of the constraints between just using a halo two point and the joint fit where we exploit the constraints of density split. And we observe across the board, we do generally get slightly weaker constraints uh, when we apply the correction, but we do consistently observe across the board, we do get constraints. Uh, um, we, we do get improvements on our constraints across the board. So now let's dig into a more in-depth discussion of what these results mean. So as I mentioned, we do observe across all PNG shapes and the lambda CDM parameters and bias parameters, we do observe improvement across all of these. And in particular, when marginalizing over the parameters, we notice even more improvement. And this is indicative of density splits, degeneracy breaking capability between the different parameters. We observe the most significant improvement for equilateral and orthogonal PNG by factors of about nine and four respectively. And this intuitively makes sense because these are the parameters where most of the information is contained in the bi spectrum as opposed to the power spectrum. And this validates the hypothesis that density split is indeed probing higher order information. One of the more surprising results though is that we don't observe as strong improvement for local PNG. Uh, we observe only about a factor of 1.4, and it turns out most of this extra information is actually found on smaller scales, which contradicts the expectation that we that we'd see significant cosmic variance cancellation due to the scale dependent bias. So some of the possible explanations for this lack of cosmic variance cancellation can include a that the scale dependent bias expression uh, from the Dalal et al. 2008 model uh, isn't actually a good fit to our density split functions. Uh, and this could be for a variety of reasons. For example, um, redshift space effects, exclusion effects based on the fact that we're using a, a larger smoothing radius, um, the fact that these quantiles don't technically constitute um, conventional Poisson sample tracers, et cetera. Uh, and B, uh, also because uh, these quantiles don't have as strong uh, correlation in their noise as they would need to to observe significant uh, improvement. In other words, 
we need the shot noise contribution to be negligible compared to cosmic variance. And this would mean having a correlation coefficient in the noise that's relatively close to one. And we don't necessarily observe this. So I'm just going to briefly summarize what we've discussed in this talk so far. Uh, we began with a discussion of the different PNG types and their implications for discriminating between different theories for cosmic inflation. We then proceeded to introduce density split clustering as an alternative method for constraining PNG uh, by probing higher order information that would normally be captured in the bispectrum. We also discussed how density split does indeed, using our Fisher formalism, does indeed provide significant improvement in constraining power over uh, conventional two-point statistics across all the PNG shapes and lambda CDM and bias parameters. But we observe the most significant improvement uh, for equilateral and orthogonal uh, PNG. On the other hand, uh, the more surprising result was that we observed less significant improvement for PNG of local type, despite expecting to see cosmic variance cancellation due to scale-dependent bias. All right, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for listening to my talk, and I look forward to a meaningful and productive uh, discussion with all of you in the coming weeks. Uh, in the meantime, if anyone has any questions, they're welcome to reach out to me by uh, the email I've attached here. Thank you for listening.